welcome to all of you. It's lovely to see you here today. Um, a special welcome to students, to teachers from our partnership schools. Um, these conferences, which we call STAR conferences, are really our way of thanking all our partnership schools for the amazing work you do with us in training our next generation of teachers. I know our students are grateful, and we are. It's a genuine partnership, and I want to say a huge thank you to you. And I'm delighted today to welcome Professor Henrietta Dombey. Uh, it is a privilege to have her with us today. Um, Henrietta has been the past chair of NATE, the National Association for the Teaching of English. She's also been the president of UK, UKLA, the United Kingdom Literacy Association. She's got a wealth of knowledge, and I know this is going to be a very important talk for us all. In addition to her understanding of what goes on in this country, she's got a wealth of international experience, um, having spent time in Zanzibar, and also been on the International Committee for UKLA, and particularly the Books for Africa project. It's a real privilege to welcome you here. Thank you very much, and we'll hand over now to Professor Henrietta Dunn. Well, thank you. <coughs> that was a very um, awesome and generous introduction. Um, I just am rather nervous though, at the thought that uh, I'm here. I've got to give you something that will make you feel uh, duly thanked for your splendid work with the teaching students. So I'm going to cross my fingers and hope that you feel a look at phonics. We'll do the job. Um, we'll see. Anyway, this is what I've had to talk about. Um, why children need phonics? A bit about that. A bit to remind us. I mean, we don't, you know, we don't really need telling, but every now and then the kids will remind ourselves of phonics is necessary. But why? And instead of saying learning to read, it should say why phonics is problematic, because that's what it's really about. And then other strategies for learning to read in English. Reading's more than word identification. Um, then I want to go into international surveys, in particular into PAL's Programme for International Reading Literacy Survey. <coughs> um, and changes in our international standing, that standard was got deleted and didn't. I apologise for that. Government initiatives since 2001, and then responses to the phonics reading check before I look at the way forward. So that's the plan of what I propose to do. Right, here's why we need phonics. Here is a text, and the text taken <coughs> from a real book written for kids to enjoy. And we can all read it, can't we? Because we can use the context to guess. And we've got the initial letters even. So one day she went for a... Yes, we can all do that. That's no problem. We all know it's for. Oh, I see a... Fox. Fox, yes. Because you're immediately thinking, tale for kids, what are they going to be seeing? Is that all that tuned up? I see a fox in the bushes. Yes, correct. Now then. Um, what, did the, what, what did the whatever say? Good girl. What else? What else have we got? Goodness gracious. Goodness gracious. Yes. Golly gosh. Golly gosh. Golly gosh. Yeah, what else? Anything else? It was good grief. Good grief. It was it's Australian, it's Mem Fox. So maybe you you know you can hear that. Good grief. Uh, so uh, Duck or dog, isn't there? Maybe there's something else, I don't know. But duck or dog is likely. Um, what about the next one? <laughs> yes, actually, you got carried away uh, there and you got brought up short by the last gym. Any other guesses? 
What's wrong? It's good. Very good. <laughs> well, well. That's what it says. Well, well, said the... <laughs> it's the goat. <laughs> the tuning. It's a uh, very It's the goat. <clears throat> now then, this is, this is the poser. What now is a pretty good guess. It's actually what next. What next said the... <laughs> so, even where you've got a maximally supportive context, even where you've got initial letters, uh, it's actually, you actually need a bit more. And I've given you all the intervening words, so we need five. And accuracy often matters. Not just the first time, though. <laughs> Even combined with the basic site si uh, vocabulary, and let's say words like send and the, I mean that basic site vocabulary, context cues are not enough to support accurate word identification. Um, and even if you've learned to site vocabulary of a thousand words, which takes quite a bit of posting in a thousand words learned to cite the cavalry. Imagine a thousand flashcards gone through a thousand times. Um, that puts a strain on the memory and is not enough even for that little text. It's not enough. So you need phonics. We've got an alphabetic system. The letters give a clue to pronunciation. It is foolish and actually mean if we don't let kids in on that. There's a code and the children need to break it. Well you know all this, all this is familiar knowledge to you. They need to develop those independent strategies of word recognition. Um, and not only do they need to be independent, but they need to be able to recognise words efficiently <coughs> and quickly. And they need to make sense of the system, of how our system works, and what its patterns are. Right, now the National Primary, Primary National Strategy says, on, I like this, it makes sense. Phonic work should be an ambitious, enjoyable, and time-limited part of the reading journey. So that makes good sense. There we go. But, we're learning to read, uh, we're teaching children to read in English. And English poses problems for phonics. This is Usha Goswami. I don't know whether you've come across her work. She is, a, she's now a professor at Cambridge, professor of neurology at Cambridge. Um, she's a very distinguished lady. She's quite young, actually. Um, I'm amazed that her daughter's now 14. She's really very young. She's very, very thoughtful and very concerned for teachers. But she's extremely knowledgeable, both about how our language works and how our spelling systems work, and about how children's brains work. And she says, the study of reading acquisition across different languages illustrates that there are two major constraints, I put the emphasis there, on the acquisition of efficient phonological recoding skills, i.e taking the letters off the page and turning them into phones. One is the phonological complexity of the language. The second constraint is the consistency of the symbol to sound. Now both these constraints make it hard to learn to read in English. The sound structure of spoken English is more complex than the sound structure of many other European languages. The spelling system is more complex. Now, <coughs> most of us are aware of the complexity of the spelling system, and sometimes we tell ourselves, oh, there isn't, you know, it's all just random, but it's not, but it's complex. But 
a sound system? But not really. As a wear of that, let's look at that a bit. First of all is the syllable structure. Spanish and Italian syllables tend to be consonant plus vowel, like causa, vino, and for a three-syllable word, tavola. Do you see how it's very, very straightforward? You have a simple consonant on the whole, not always. There are words in Italian like strong as well. Sorry, I learned that off Inspector Montalban. <laughs> Uh, there are complex words like that, but on the whole, Spanish and Italian tend to be, and Finnish too, tend to have simple sound structure. So you can imagine it's much easier for children to learn to hear those phonemes, to develop initial phonemic awareness. I mean, we've all taught children who spell wet, W-E-T because they can't hear that N in it, that faint nasalization of the T that we know is an N sound. No such problem, or not nearly as much problem, in Spanish and Italian. English syllables, and German and Polish too, we're not alone in this, there are other languages with complex syllables. Um, tend to be complex, like string and glimpse. Do you see how we've got? We jam all those consonants together at the front of the syllable and at the back of the syllable. So this means that it's really, together, it, 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 the whole thing means it's much harder, as I said, to develop, for kids to develop that phonemic awareness. <coughs> Might as well didn't turn mine off, so that goes on. <laughs> Um, right. But vowels, vowels also present a problem. I was really struck by this when I was in a train in Spain. And I was trying to read an article that a friend had pressed on me, a colleague in Spain, um, where I'd been visiting some wonderful primary schools. And I was trying to read this article, and of course I had the dictionary with me. And I started reading the beginning part of the dictionary, and it suddenly registered. Spain, Spanish, has just got five distinct vowel sounds, and Italian the same, and English has twelve, and that's not counting the difference. We've got all those vowel sounds. So we've got all the consonants at the front of the word, loads of vowels in the middle of the word, and then all those consonants at the back. That's just in the, in the circle. And then there's the other area of complexity, the other constraint, which is the orthographic inconsistency. This is a posh way of saying, you know, not uh, unsimple spelling, complex spelling. The absence of a one-to-one -one relationship between phoneme and graphy. We all know you get multiple spellings of the same phoneme. In sheep, shore, passion, chef, ocean, station, and you could probably find another spelling for sh if you look hard enough. And then multiple pronunciations. So the French have got that. The French have got lots of ways of spelling O, for example. It can be O, it can be O-H, it can be E-O-U, it can be A-U. But they haven't got this nasty other side to it that we've got, which is multiple pronunciations of the same spelling. So there's the A in tap and tall, and that's not all. The O-N-E in lone, gone, and one. The R-E-A-D in red and ringed. And then, if you look at this, the cat was born in the past another gate. That's a pretty tough sentence, isn't it? 
You catch with falling, but you can visualize all your gates. You catch falling past them. It was falling past another gate. How many ways, how many vowel sounds does that letter A represent? <coughs> Well, there's the first one in cat. So that's a straightforward act. That's the kind we teach the kids, right? Was, that's an R. Falling, or past, another, uh. So we've got, oh, and then there's gate. Right. So A, a uh, R, or, or, ah. Six, isn't it? Um, and that, and we expect kids to learn to read. <laughs> so there's no doubt that learning to read in English takes longer. An international <coughs> study of children receiving construction products at the start of school showed that. In Greek, Finnish, German, and Italian, and Spanish, they gave all these kids, I should explain, all the children were given the same phonics test after they'd started school. So they weren't all the same age because they start school at seven and four or five here and so on. But they were given the same phonics test. And in all these countries, the Greek, the Finnish, etc., halfway through their first year, the kids were just about at this evening. They had a test which I may say was not totally dissimilar to the dreaded phonic screening check. And halfway through the first year, they could do it. And this is what I hear from all my continental friends in the uh, Federation of European Literacy Associations. Well, you teach them to read in the first six months. <coughs> and, that, and they can do it. Scottish children, because English children weren't tested, but Scottish children had standing for our kids. And they had scores, and they're not worse than us in Scotland, that okay. case. They had scores of 34% and 29% for non-words. 34% for real words and 29% for non-words at the end of their first year of school. So they're way behind their continental counterparts. And after, even after two years of tuition, the kids learning to read in English, the Scottish kids, scored only 79% of the words, 64% for non-words. In other words, kids learning to read in English found it much, much more difficult to do a phonics test. Okay, you might say they were having different tuition. Attempt was made that they were all being taught phonics. I mean, that's, that was, to join in this, they all had to be taught phonics. Let's take something closer to home. This is Welsh-speaking and English-speaking schools in the same local authority. And the Welsh-speaking kids, and they've got the same curriculum. And the Welsh-speaking kids, was anybody here brought, taught to read on, in Welsh? Just by accident. Oh, there is some. And you can tell us perhaps your, your experience. Yes, sir, very phonetic. Every word, has, every letter has a sound, and there's no. Um, oh, there's, there's no messing about. No. No. <laughs> right. And then, you know, as well, every, every um, 11 is in a day, it means um, 1 and 10. 1 and, and 10. 12, so and it's, it's, it's absolutely it's transparent there, too. But mm. let's stick with the reading for a minute. Um, the Welsh kids read twice as many words accurately as the English speaking children after the same amount of reading instruction, using the same approach. Now then, this sentence by Goswami, I think we should have engraved on our hearts because we are made to feel so often that we're doing, excuse me, a crap job in, in 
our primary schools here, and we're not. What Kaswani says, the evidence from these studies makes it inherently unlikely that one method of teaching phonics will suddenly cause English children to perform like Finnish children. It's unissued here, but I think it's worth noting. Right, so there are implications for teaching children to read in English. Um, and Letters and Sounds recognises all of this, but doesn't look at the implications for teaching. Um, Spanish and Italian children easily develop an awareness of phonemes and have a consistent spelling to uh, consistent spelling system to learn. So we should be absolutely thrilled when at 10 our kids perform better than the Spanish and Italian kids. They don't perform better than the Italian, they do perform better than the Spanish at the moment, as far as we know. It makes good sense for those children to focus chiefly on matching letters and sounds. Although there have been moves, I know, uh, my friend in the north of Spain, Valencia showed me moves to get the kids reading much more real text and writing much more real text because they said it was all just an arid exercise. But in England, we need to think carefully about how we teach children to read English. Not to pretend it's like Spanish or Italian. Because it's not. Now then, otherwise we get problems. I'm going to skate through this. There's a year one class in a school, a very good school in South Coast Town with a good reputation for teaching reading. And their teacher's got a poem, a large bit of paper for the children to read, and it's about treasures from the sea. And to make it easier, she's taking them through the hard words before they check the poem as a whole. And she's helping them to sound out the word treasure. But the vowel letters break, break the rules the children have learned. And the S represents neither the S of sit nor the Z of, mm -hmm. of in. So, as you imagine, and I've got a video of this, and I think it's so hard on her, I've only shown the video. I've got a video of all the kids saying things like, when, when they get to the EA bit, of course they can do TR. When they get to the EA bit, they're saying things like, eat, 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 eat like an eat, and like it meat. Um, and then she says to say, well, no, actually. And of course, she then says, it's like a head, right. Then when they get to the earth, it's And she says, well, no, actually. And one little wise character says, like it was. And she has to say, well, no, actually. <laughs> and then there's quite a struggle with the UR. And to tell you frankly, when she gets to the E, she says, I don't know why that's there. <laughs> now, I would say that you, you know, a word like that is not at all easy to get out through straight phonics. But those children knew the word measure. They had to learn the word measure as a sight word to do all the measuring that they were doing. And actually, if the teacher had merely pointed to measure and said, you know what that's like, now let's take the mm off there, what have we got? Now then, what about if we put the tr on here? In other words, rhyme and analogy could help them. Many of the irregularities of English operate at the level of rhyme. Not all of them, but many. Many words that can't be sounded out in classic fashion can do actually fall into rhyming groups like fast and past, cold and soul, and indeed measure and treasure. Although there aren't any others. I mean, leisure is a bit of a cheat, isn't it? But it's not quite the same. And actually, this is what better readers do, whether we teach them or not. 
better readers, the better readers amongst those in your class or in your school, will actually operate not sounding things out one way at a time. That's not the way they go about it. Brown and Devers found that they operated differently from children learning to read in Italian and Spanish. Children who learn to read effectively in English adopt what they call flexible unit size strategies. They work some words out letter by letter, yes. And others using larger units, such as the rhyme, asked, old, and leisure. The rhyme, the part uh, from the vowel to the end, strictly speaking of the syllable. So that's the asked and the old and past and cold. But children in England have got to do this for themselves. They're not taught it in school. The brighter ones will do it. The brighter ones, because they are actually committed to seeing patterns, will do it. And they will know that that word says sold. They know it. They know old. And so that word with a on it, it's going to say fold. They won't go for oh, look, uh, until we followed, um, which is a classic. I mean, yes. Anyway, Jewel and Minden Cup, researchers in the States, have shown that teaching with a flexible unit approach is more effective effective than teaching with synthetic phonics on its own. But are we allowed to be flexible? And then we have to think about what we know about the most effective schools. Funny enough, this is not research the government ever very little of the research I've indicated the government is, is research the government would point us towards. Um, and some of this research actually is sponsored by the government and they still kept quiet about it. Why? Because the conclusions were not what they wanted. Most effective literacy learning takes place with a balanced approach in which attention to word recognition skills is matched by attention to comprehension. And isn't that what we should all try and do? Sometimes we forget, sometimes we get really caught up and forget the importance of actually having something there on the wall that the kids really do want and need to read and feel something about. Then you also need attention to individual children's literacy skills, experience and interests through high quality interaction and close <coughs> monitoring. And thirdly, you need high levels of engagement in reading. And if you, if you don't have those, you will never have the most effective school class. Those are absolutely key, and they come through study after study after study. These are huge studies. Most of them are American. They're absolutely vast studies. You can find them back listed. But the Medwell et al. I'll tell you a bit about Jane Medwell and colleagues when they were at Exeter did a piece of work for the teacher training agency, as it then was. And their piece of work looked at um, teachers who were nominated as highly effective teachers of literacy. And they were nominated by the local advisors, by the head teachers, and in terms of the scores their kids got. So all three pointed to the fact that these were highly effective teachers. They were compared with, and they were asked to compare them with the worst teachers. And they said, no, we're not going to go out to find the worst teachers and study them and let them know that they've been studied because they're the worst teachers. We don't think that's a good idea. So it was a comparison group, and they just chose maths coordinators. And amongst the maths coordinators, of course, you have the good, the bad, and the, the good, the less good, and the indifferent. 
And you, you know, so they were a comparison group. And they found that the most effective teachers embedded their phonics teaching in teaching for meaning and had a focus of, of teaching for meaning throughout. They also found that they were much more knowledgeable about children's books than they were about the technicalities of English language. So that did not get publicised. In fact, you really had to go and kind of uh, go and ask to be given copies of it. It was very, very difficult to get copies of their studies. But it exists. I managed to get 300 of them. Well, you were a conference, not a group um, Does this matter? Well, England isn't doing so well in international studies and reading as it used to. You know, the irony is that before all the strategies and everything came in, we were doing not too badly. And if you consider we still had the same English language as contemporary then, um, we were doing not too badly at all. Um, and I would love to be able to give you the latest results of the survey carried out in 2011, but we'll have to wait until December the 11th this year when it's published. Um, so now we've got to rely on the 2006 figures and how they relate to the group before. Well, England's average score for reading dropped. 500 is taken as the mean. Right, so we're above the mean, um, but it's uh, the, the 29 countries involved are a big range, including countries like Iran and Morocco, and countries with real problems. So we're above the mean, but our rank order dropped from 13th out of 29 to 13th out of 29, from 3 out of 36. That's pretty awful, isn't it? I mean, the Dutch and the Finnish, no, the Finnish don't take part in this. The Finns who are ahead on everything that they put in for, the Finns don't put their children in this. They say they've tested quite enough. You know, they tested at 16. <laughs> um, and um, so, it's a serious drop between 2001 and 2006, and I honestly don't think we're going to have plummeted up the scale much, unless other countries have had dire things happening and they've gone down. Um, in percentage terms, England's drop in reading scores was exceeded only by Romania and Morocco. Well, you know what? Well, Remember all the singing and dancing that was going on between 2001 and 2006? The fall in England's performance is evident across the ability range. But it's not just performance that's worrying. Because the Pulse test also tests attitude. I think that's really important. I mean, what? There's not much joy in having taught a child to read very effectively and efficiently if they never read and only ever play on their uh, little handheld device or their Xbox or whatever, and never read. But only 40% of our kids had a positive attitude to reading, while 15% had a negative attitude. Now, the decline wasn't perhaps as marked in that as in other areas, but England came 23rd from the top. The Italian kids read better than us, and they certainly like reading more, and the Russian kids like them. And the Italian kids, you feel it's not just because they've got quite an easy challenge, which they have, as we've seen. Attitudes to reading of 10 year old children in England are poor compared to many other countries that have declined slightly since 2001. Girls generally more positive than boys. In England and in most other countries, there's a positive association between attitude to reading and reading attainment. It's easier to teach a kid who likes it. It's easier to teach a child who thinks it's a pleasure to be given a book. And Pearl's 2006 
showed that attempts to remedy the problems revealed in 2001 have been largely successful. Well, what's the government, the government, done since 2001? Well, we've had official moves to place more creativity on English, on ed, create, sorry, more emphasis on creativity with excellence and enjoyment. I'm not quite sure how much follow-up there was. It's a nice document, actually. I'm not quite sure, you know, whether anybody really cared what happened to it. And attempts to persuade the children to read more. There have been some attempts, the Reading Connects project, um, but I'm not sure how widely that is spread how much emphasis that's been given, and what else has happened. It's an increasing emphasis on the technical aspects of learning to read. And then there was the Rose Report, which concluded about the need for children at five to have experienced high quality systematic phonics work, preceded by pre reading activity. <coughs> Um, and high quality phonic work should be taught as the prime approach in learning to decode and to encode. <clears throat> high quality doesn't mean taking account of the structure of English. It means rigid adherence to the myth that English is a phonemically, has a phonemically regular rhyming system. Anyway, um, then there's letters and sounds which expect a child at the end of reception year to be able to blend and segment frogs and jumps, frog and jumps. And then there's all the in-service work on phonics teaching and the inclusion of phonics in the early learning goals. And from September 2008, it's been mandatory on all providers of preschool education for child care in England. Child care? <laughs> Conformative. Um, the uh, change in the early learning goals and all of that. Well, you're familiar with all of that. And now the current government has gone one step further, bringing testing into the bodies game. And not just testing for research purposes, but testing as in class fail, on its screening check. It isolates one crucial aspect of the... How many of you have been involved in the on its screening check this year? I expect 100% of you. Have you. Is there anybody who hasn't been involved in the its screening check? Just a few of you. Gosh, you've got half a right. <laughs> so you teach older children? Younger. 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 younger, right. Younger. Right. And you're in a special school. Right. Um, it isolates one crucial aspect of the reading process and tests it out of the context of reading. And as well as phonically straightforward, real words, it involves a lot of non words and that is a classic psychologist's way of checking whether kids are using phonics or not. We can understand the logic of it, but and it has to be taken by all children in regular school, even those progressing well in their reading. Now, the United Kingdom Literacy Association carried out, or commissioned rather, a survey of teachers and schools' responses to the phonics check. It was actually carried out because we didn't want to carry it out ourselves. People would say, oh, you only found what you wanted to find. It was carried out independently by researchers at Sheffield Hallam University. And it involved a range of questions about the phonics check as undertaken. Does anybody refer to the PSC? No. I, I did that and then I thought, 
Nobody else says that, do they? Anyway, in June 2012, including the time commitment, the pupil preparation by um, year one teachers, the usefulness, its usefulness in identifying overlooked problems, and its usefulness in identifying the level of children's reading, particularly the more successful readers. And they got 494 responses, which was quite hard. <coughs> and responses were collated by the team and then further analysed by the youth club. What about the identification? How useful was it? What about the identification of um, more successful readers? Only 17.3% 70, of the respondents reported that 100% of good fluent readers achieved the required level to pass the phonics test. You don't have to get them all right, you have to get 42, is it? Well, anyway, whatever it was, the threshold. So it's not, you're not asking kids to get it all right, otherwise I think about one child in the country. Okay. Anyway, and what is meant by good fluent readers are those on track for a level 2B or above at the end of year 1. Well, that's a pretty good reader. Um, and 17.3 said, yes, 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 that check pointed it out. Whereas 73.4 of the respondents reported that one or more of their good readers failed to meet the expected standard. So they're a good reader, intended, expected to get to level 2B by the end of year 1, and yet they can't do this. Schools overwhelmingly stated that there were far too many nonsense words. Now, is this your experience? And that these confused, particularly the more fluent readers, who kept trying to make words from them. Because they'd been taught that reading was about actually language, words, meaning. Um, and children who had no broader, I mean, the children who came to school with quite a good experience of books and reading found it particularly difficult. But the children who came to school with very little experience of that, and who'd had teachers who'd mainly focused on phonics, <coughs> could do it. What does that say? Now, one teacher, one head teacher, uh, the things in italics are direct quotes, said, none of my children who failed are unable to read. The vast majority of schools stated that the nonsense words confused children. And one head teacher stated that better readers stumble over nonsense words as they expect words to follow certain rules. For example, send was read as the end. Did anybody else experience that? Right. 33 schools specifically identified problems with the non word strong. <laughs> Which was, of course, read as storm. One head teacher said the failures in the text were entirely due to the nonsense words. Most children could read all the real words using both phonics and other strategies. Several commented that the words couldn't be named as they didn't have capital letters. And actually, that's a thought. A lot of unknown phonics tests where, a grammar test, test of kids' grammar knowledge, where the tester said to the child, here's a one, giving the capital W. Oh look, here's two more, what are they? And the child is supposed to say two marks, showing that they know how to make a plural. Right, but there's no attempt to do that here. There's no attempt to make it any kind of, to give it any sort of sense. The children's confidence as readers. Well, many teachers reported that the check was stressful. Um, several children were upset by the check and had lost confidence in their reading. 
It has in no way supported them to learn to read and has in some cases affected their confidence in themselves as readers. And the bottom comment, the idea of passing and therefore of failing at this age is counter to the school's ethos and I believe counterproductive to children's learning and self-esteem. And they felt that there were implications with parents. Parents of children who were working towards the pass mark were inevitably upset and despite what anyone said regarded it as a fail. Implications for school organisation. Uh, 88.4% said the check took two or more days to complete. 73.8% of the schools have prepared their pupils for the check with practice activities. Some to relieve stress on children to make them more familiar with the procedure. Some to give pupils the best chance of passing the check as it was a pass fail test. Fitness for purpose. Most recipients considered that the phonics check was not fit for purpose. There's more to reading than just phonics. I am a firm supporter of a phonics-based approach to reading and spelling and have used letters and sounds with reception and year one classes for five years. But, her own capital letters, see it as a tool, a way into reading and writing, and not an end in itself. And also recognise that there are a small number of children for whom a phonics-based approach is not appropriate. And also that there is far more to reading decoding the ones. Ways forward. Well, I have to say at this point that apparently the Labour Party spokesman on education, whose name escapes me, oh, it's Stephen Twig, isn't it? Stephen Twig has said, when Labour comes to power, they'll scrap it. So that's what I'm saying. <laughs> be used for diagnostic purposes, not as a pass fail test. And only for those children, you know, maybe not even for them. So we do need to be very careful of it. And we also need to be allowed, we really need to press the allowed to take a more informed view of phonics teaching, recognising the role of rhyme and learning by analogy as well as synthetic phonics, so that we can actually teach year one children the word treasure. Um, we should ensure that all technical teaching is balanced by attention to meaning and that children understand what reading is really about. And the problem of attitude has really got to be solved. We're very good on the sure start in this country, although this government lives with pressing it a bit. We've got an abundance of wonderful books for children, old and new. Debbie and I were talking about that. But our ten-year-olds increasingly dislike reading and probably writing. We go to Sweden, I can tell you, and they've got just as many electronic toys in Sweden, if not more. Finland as well. Finland stick with electronic toys. Uh, you know, so many of them are made there. But the kids read. And they like reading and they want books as presents. They say they don't like socks. <laughs> um, and we need to make our primary classrooms places where young children extend their enjoyment of life. Their knowledge of the world, the lives and dreams of others, and the hopes and fears that we share. And their sense of identity as well as their technical skills. Thank you. Okay. Um, I'll take questions, comments, observations, really, on uh, Henrietta's talk. I just want to make an observation rather than a direct question. That's also possible. I'll come round or I'll communicate you with Mike, does that seem to be working? If anybody wants to say anything, share anything, or question any of that, anything in particular? Um, I'd just like to agree. Um, 
I'm totally opposed to these non-words. I mean, I taught French for a few years, and but I mean, English is such a, a rich language. You have such a huge, massive vocabulary. Why would we want to teach non-words? I mean, well, I mean, the theory is this. The theory is that that's the only way you know that a child is using phonics. And I can understand the logic of it. Because if it's a word they could have come across in somewhere else, who's to know whether they didn't memorize it as a whole? Do you see? But then there are so many words they won't have come across. No, you can't. You can't possibly. You, you, you really can't. And, and actually, for them, anyway, it would just be as effectively the same. If most hadn't come across it, it would be a nonsense word for them, yeah, too. Like, I remember when I started teaching um, kids who hadn't learned to read at all in the infants, the equivalent of year three, and they hadn't learned to read at all in the infants, this the golden days. <laughs> anyway, um, uh, we used to test them on the Shomel graded word reading test. And there were a lot of words up there that didn't mean anything to them because they were words from an earlier age, like canary. Well, nobody had canary, they had budgies. <laughs> right? So they all used to say canary, and you weren't, you know, that was out. <laughs> it's interesting because a colleague who teaches uh, said to me that uh, her, one of her writer readers was doing the nonsense word test. And uh, when he came across it, she said, Do you think that's a word or not a real word? She said, I don't know. It might not. It might be a word, but perhaps I don't know it yet. And I thought, That's a sure. I mean, I just have never encountered it yet. You know, and I just yes. thought, Well, there's a canny little but, reader. So that's the reason for putting it in, but that actually is not a strong enough reason for a, a pass-fail test. But isn't it because you're teaching towards the test? Yes, yes and that's a real, real danger. Yes. It's a huge danger. In fact, actually, there are lots of huge dangers, because I forgot to end on the gloomy note. <laughs> <laughs> but if we don't make our classrooms places of life and joy and give the children some real sense of what reading is about and what it can do for them and how it can empower them, you end up with three, four and five year olds learning that to read, learning that the process of learning to read is about learning rules uh, and not thinking for yourself and that reading and writing and set of skills and activities you master to keep your parents and your teacher happy. And that written text exists to exemplify phonic rules and tests or the written text exists to do that rather than, you know, being there for meaning. And meaning, imagination and pleasure have little place in literacy learning. And this is the risk we're running. And quite honestly, teaching to the test and all of that is going to drive us right down on the international test that matters, which is the polls one. And it's going to you know, I mean, it just is so unbelievably short-sighted. This international test, where we used to be, if not cock of the walk, we used to be pretty darn good at it. Pretty darn good at it. And now, we're not, it's not because we teachers are less good than we might be. It's because we have been constrained to teach in such a narrow way. And I think what we've got to try and do is wherever we can in the framework, we, you know, you have to use the framework that's there, but wherever you can insert things that make sense, things that enlarge, show kids pat rhyming patterns at an appropriate level to where they are, and um, just make it entertaining and meaningful. Any other comments? Questions or anything else? I'm sure you've got some. Something that you said, I'm a year six teacher. Uh -huh. I'm just saddened by the, the number of boys, particularly, like in parents' consultations, they just won't read, they, they're turned off reading. It does really. And I recommend texts, and I'm very passionate about all of them. Yes. You, do, you do everything you can, but still. And it's very interesting what you said about something like Finland, where they're the same distractions, the, the computer games, all of that, and yet they're still reading. And, it's and Russia why, too. Why, you know, particularly with our boys, how we get well, them reading? That, I mean, there have been a lot of interesting studies, and there was a very interesting one by Graham Freighter, 
Uh, there was a very interesting work done by the Centre for Literacy and Primary Education. Graham Frazier did his, I think, the Basic Skills Trust. He used to be Chief English HMI. And, um, I mean, he said it isn't a question of having lots of male role models and lots of books about football. I mean, that's a bit of a start. But it's actually, he feels that in the end, we, well, he feels from the surveys that he's done, that what distinguishes the schools where there's a very small difference between the boys' schools, boys schools and the girls' schools is really good teaching. And an overall school atmosphere of expectation throughout the school is the tone of the school and also the support of the local authority. So you're controlling your classroom, but it's got to spread out into the school. And part of the thing is, it's a social thing, isn't it, for boys? Is it cool to be seen reading or not? And it's actually quite a challenge for the school to change the culture outside the school. Because in a way, that's what you've got to do, isn't it? 